for now we are putting the hold on Romans. We are going to pick up where we left off in Ireland. And uh, uh, strangely enough, you would not necessarily believe this, but there's a lot of parallels between the two. I mean, I'm, I'm in both of them, and um, there are. And in fact, um, Romans seems to be the scriptural, um, how would I say, uh, technical version of uh, things. And um, uh, Noah and the story is like a picture of it or a moving pictures of it. It's kind of, you know, and I personally, I, I prefer the stories, but, um, you know, they're, they're both necessary. And so I just felt like <clears throat> that we should do that. The, um, the Noah class um, was started in Ireland this past trip. Um, uh, 2024 and I did three classes on Noah <clears throat> um, and the, the funny thing is we didn't really get to the good part we didn't and um, so um, I'm going to be picking up where we left off uh, and um, the um, uh, the end of the last class, <clears throat> I don't know, we didn't, I don't think anybody officially said that was going to be the last class, but I kind of felt like it would be. And so at, so at the end, I just shoved a whole lot of material <laughs> in the end of it, which is real good, and I, you'll still get it. But that was only a small portion of what we're going to cover. So if you end up doing, which I, I would recommend, that you get hold of the, um, the NOAA classes that were shared in Ireland and catch up, I think it'll be real beneficial. And again, we, we really hadn't even gotten to the, the really good stuff yet. So anyway, all right, um, let's go to Genesis 6. Not counting the hours that are being listened to here. No, I just need this sore throat to go away. <clears throat> All right, Genesis chapter 6. And um, we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. Well, actually, we'll go 6 through 9. But I'll read. I'll start with the 6 then. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. But then the very next verse is this, verse eight or well eight but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and then verse nine these are the generations of Noah Noah was a just man and perfect in all in his generations and Noah walked with God okay so <clears throat> what we started studying there and and I didn't get a lot of show of hands um, with that group but uh, I mentioned the uh, one man theory and basically the idea is that everything was carried out by one man well if you go to Romans 5 you can read it real quickly and you can see that by one man sin came and by one man it went across all of the universe and all of the people and all of the whatever um, but by one man, Jesus, righteousness came, and all of that, you know, was turned. <clears throat> but it's not really meant to be um, this one man did this, and this one man did that. 
it is in our minds and it is in the trying to conceptualize some of it. But it is the fact that God has one man, one person, his son, that is everything and in whom all things will be fulfilled and in whom all things consist and in whom he is well pleased. So it's, it's more than just understanding this guy messed up and this guy fixed everything. And that's the way a lot of times it's taught in Bible schools and churches and, and stuff like that. So it's like you miss the whole thing. So in the, the uh, story of Noah, Noah is the only one. Noah was the one that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he represents the Lord in two different ways. In fact, um, um, well, I'll, I'll just read this. The, the subtopic is seeing the sun in two ways. Now, you know, in the, in the world of Dunn, this is all true. This is all stuff in the book of Romans. It's, it's uh, important to understand that, uh, uh, it, that it's not just um, the world was messed up and uh, sin was everywhere. And so God sent his son down here and his son fixed it all and hurrah, you know. It's so much more than that if it goes before time. Because it's not even about sin. Because it's not even about problems. Because it's not even about you or me, ultimately, except as we are related to him. And so, um, so the story of Noah is trying to help us to realize that when God said, when God chose Noah that that represents his son and it's going to represent his son in multitude of ways but two two ways that I wanted to put as sort of a bridge here um, and that is as the son of man and as the pristine son you're familiar with that right so as you see we're not jumping around we're not skipping around we are um, just having a story start explaining these things a little bit better. All right, so as representing the pure son before time, Noah was the only one acceptable among all mankind. And therefore God did everything through that one man. All other than corruption and the world, you know, being fallen apart, all was contingent on that one man. And that one man represents Jesus. And so, uh, as representing the pure son before time, Noah was the only one acceptable am among all mankind. No one else would do. The transition between beloved son to the son of man is seen when God gave him a prepared, or I, I put it in parenthesis, prepared beforehand blueprint. We're talking about the ark. We're talking about, we're talking about the plan. We're talking about the way and the means that this is brought about. So, um, uh, well, I even wrote it like that. We're talking about the instru instructions as to how to build the ark. Of course, this ark would hold the key to life and death. It would be life for those who would be in him and death for the rest, right? Or would it be? Or would it be? When Jesus went to the cross, he took all into death. He took us all, everybody. Um, it was a once and for all death. Are you familiar with that? little phraseology where at what book Hebrews. Romans for sure but yes Hebrews 2 uh, that that he died once for all not just once and for all he died once and for all well it is true 
He died once and for all, and he's not going to have to die again. Okay? So that if someone, you know, on the, on the timeline back here, let's draw a line, you know. Um, um, so God creates everything, and then God creates a man, and then this man receives the Lord, you know. And then another person does, and, and you know, I just keep drawing these little people going in this direction, and they receive the Lord. And in so doing that, Jesus didn't die. How did I, I write, wrote that in here? Um, well, I wrote it like this. We say Jesus died for me. I want you to think about this, please. That's so common, isn't it? Jesus died for me. But Jesus died once, a long time ago, and that one death took everybody into death. In other words, in other words if somebody gets saved tomorrow out from the group that uh, Kelly and their, them that are doing, and they get saved tomorrow, Jesus isn't going to have to come down and die for them. Right? Nobody will he have to die for now because he died f for us and as us. He not only died for us, he died as us so that we would be put to death. Can I get amen? Amen. Because, you know, Adam and Eve, you shall surely die. What do they do? Well, they go and hide. And they go and cover themselves. And they go and blame somebody else because they're trying to, to get away from death. They're, you know, trying to cover up everything. But Jesus died for all. Okay. So you say, well, how does that fit in with the story of of uh, Noah, you know, because a whole lot of people died and this and that. Well, we'll get into it, but we have to think beyond the regular um, church entity concept that Jesus died for me because he didn't die for you. He died to put you to death and you rose as one with him. He is your resurrection. But, but Christianity is so focused on themselves and so focused, and, I, and I'm not trying to be critical. I, I'm just trying to make sure that we see clearly the issues or we will always just go, well, Jesus died for me and I accepted him and everybody else is going to hell. Yay. No, no. In fact, the whole reality that we teach with the world have done is he took care of all sin before the foundation of the world. Did y'all forget that? Because y'all really were quick to say, <laughs> you know, yes. It's all about the good ones being saved and the bad ones drowning. It's like little signs that we're driving along and we have to recognize the sign and go, oh, I ain't falling for that. I know what, I know from the scriptures what happened. And to be honest with you, that's one of the reasons why we took off on Romans. The problem with Romans is the problem with every other thing I teach. I'm so far ahead on it that I thought, we need a little break with the technical side. And we need to see this from another angle, but it's the same thing. All right, so. Um, so he didn't die for some. When a person receives salvation, Jesus doesn't have to die again. And that was my point of this little chart here, is that any time somebody receives Jesus, he doesn't have to die. He died for them when? Way, okay, when did he, if you, if you say he died for you, um, Mallory, when did he die for you? Before the world. <laughs> 
so long ago that it was not on a timeline. So long ago that it's not on a timeline. Before creation, before time, before all of that, he died for the, all the sins. And, I, and I'd rather, you know, use this term. He took care of all the sins of the world. So, there's not a whole lot of deaths every time. You know, that's where you, that's where you have to go. He didn't die for men. He died for us and all of us. And then you say, well, he didn't, he didn't, re he didn't resurrect me. He is my resurrection Amen. and the life. Amen. And that's where I look. I am in him. Hallelujah. I am in him and I am understood. I, my identification as a being is I'm in him. Amen. You may live on this earth, but you are in him. And that's, that's the way he sees you. And if you, if, you, if you struggle a little bit with that, it's real simple. Just go to Colossians 3, read a few verses down, and you'll, you'll go, woo, whoopee. <laughs> it's just really good. All right. So, um, so at the end of that, I wrote that this. Here's the good news. He died as you. So that, why? So that you would be dead. So that, why? So that he would be your life. Why, why else? So that you wouldn't have to pay for all those things that you did. I know, some of you think, well, I didn't do much. Well, there's some of us. <laughs> all right, so... Um, So Jesus says this, and, and you don't have to turn there. Just, I'm going to read a couple, just a couple of scriptures here, but you can if you want. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Okay. He didn't say... In, in this wording, he, he didn't say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me is saved. He has everlasting life, which is a person. Because he is your life now. Amen? He's your life. And so... Eternal life is a person. It's not, you know, we don't have eternal life. We have the Son. Well, does that mean that, you know, I'll, I'll live forever? Sure, sure. Whatever, you know, keeps you from crying. <laughs> yeah, but it's still Jesus. And we rest in Jesus, not in ourselves. We're not, if the more you look at yourself, the more discouraged you're going to get. But the more you look at him, the more hope rises in your heart and, and trust. You begin to have trust, real trust, you know, not religious faith, but real trust, which is called faith. But, you know, because your trust is in him and it's and it's not based on one little deal. It's based on everything. All right. So, Revelation 1, 17 through 18 says this. Well, the last of that one that I just read says, but uh, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. See, that's passed from death unto life. You were already in death. Adam did that for you. You were already in death. I'm, I've heard people say, well, you know, 
you know, all you do is you talk about the cross and all you do is talk about death and all this kind of stuff. Jesus, you know, you know, Jesus, the cross is death, you know, no, no, it's life. It's his life. It is all meant to establish us in a life that cannot and will not fail, that will be faithful. That Remember, he comes back on a white horse and what does it say on there? Faithful and true. Faithful and true. I'm sorry, I almost saw uh, gravity, you know, draws us in. But that's not, that's not the t-shirt. He doesn't have that yet. <clears throat> All right. It's coming. <clears throat> and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Stop fighting. You know? You say, well, see, there's an example of death. Well, he's not finished. The verse isn't finished. You know, it didn't say, you know, uh, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. The end. <laughs> you know, it's the end of the book. No, it's not. It's the end of you, but it's not the end of you in him. So. At his feet is dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Is that a pretty good start? That's, uh, you fall at his feet is dead, and he says, Fear not. Fear not. Stop fearing. Why? Because he's the first and the last. Whatever, you know, it. Some people say he's the first and the last and everything in between. Well, most of the time it just says I'm the beginning and end, first and the last. It doesn't specify whatever happens in there. But I can tell you that whatever happens starting at the first and to the last, that he is that. I am the first and the last. I don't think you really have to worry about it. Do I have to theologically know everything? No. But you do have to know the Lord beyond what people call simple salvation. I mean, it is pretty simple. I mean, the world of done is more simple than simple salvation <laughs> to me. <laughs> All right. Saying unto me, fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth mm. and was dead. Amen. But he's the living one. You know, what this is saying here kind of reminds me of what Gideon was trying to share on Sunday. He kept saying, stop focusing on the dead and focus on the life, focus on him. You said that a bunch of times. Yes, amen, amen. Um, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead and behold, am alive forevermore. What do you say to that? Amen. Oh, yeah, that's the next word in the scripture. Yeah, okay. I set these people up, don't I? <laughs> and have the keys of hell and of death. Isn't that, you know, I mean, haven't you been worrying when the devil walks by and rattling those keys and you go, you know, <laughs> you know, dang it. I can't rest with him walking around like that. Well, Jesus has it all. Because Jesus is the key to life and death. Except for when you see him walking by, as it were, with the keys, you go, yeah, okay, all right, we're going to be all right now. <laughs> all right, so the scriptures in, in verse 13 uh, in Genesis 6, we're talking about the end of all flesh. And uh, I, I got into that a lot, but I want to just hit a few highlights to either, you know, 
remind you, or if you didn't hear any of this, then you'll, you'll get some. Um, so the, he talked about that. Well, I've got it right, written right here. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. All right. So we are, um, if we were in the time of Noah, we might hear God say that to Noah, or we might hear him preaching that, preacher of righteousness. But whatever happened, whatever happened, the end of all flesh happens in Christ. He takes it down into death. It will be the end of all flesh. But when he rises, you will rise in him. Again. He is your resurrection. I mean, I know some people right now that are really studying resurrection, and I, I just break it down to one word. Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And so, so when you, you realize that and you hear these words, and you hear because we heard the positives up here, Jesus said, I am he that was dead and I'm alive forevermore. Okay. That's forevermore. And you're in him. That's forevermore. But then he goes down here. Uh, we read these scriptures. And this, is, this was when God says, the end of all flesh is here. We go, no, no, no. You know, and go, um, you know, you are one with him. You are. And he didn't plan on changing that. Because when he said, behold, I am alive forevermore, that's you too. So in the sun is the end of all flesh, right? You say, well, I'm in the sun and I don't see the end of all flesh. That's because you're not seeing what he says that that's, that's already done. It, it doesn't have to be a big manifestation in you. It just has to be real in him. And you stick with him. And again, get in. You kept saying that. Stick with him. Stop getting off the rails. You didn't use those words, but nonetheless. Um, <clears throat> Uh, all right. So the end of all flesh had come up before him. If Noah is a picture of the pure son, then the death involves all flesh. It would have to. Because the, cause Jesus is the pure son and you're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. You're his members. Then it has to be talking about him. And see, we're trying to become him. Now, I'm not saying that's what we should be doing, but that's what most people, Christians, are trying. They're trying to become him. They're trying, they read the stuff that is true about him, and they try to make that true about themselves, and it's not meant to be true by you individually. You have to give up that individual mentality and you have to embrace the one that is accepted. Noah found grace and the rest of you need to shut up. Excuse my French. Meaning you need to stop trying to find grace. Well, if Noah found grace, then I need to find grace. No, if Noah represents that pure son, then you have found it. Because you're founded in him. Amen. And in him is rest. In him is rest. All right. So. Um, um, <clears throat> even Jesus died. But it happened not because he had sinned. Not because of flesh. 
But, but he died. He died. The end of all flesh. He died. Um, what did I put there? But because he, because he, as the ark, took all flesh into himself, and by us being in him, he could be both the end and the beginning. Yes. We're looking for the beginning or the end or we're, we're trying to find it. We're so timeline, you know, stuck on that we're always looking for, well, when is that going to show up in me? I'll tell you when. When you start having faith that it's true, that's it showing up. No, it is. It really is. That's the faith that, that takes care of everything. And it's that simple. Back to Romans, where we've been. Man, it's just that simple. But we just keep being alive to ourselves instead of, you know, alive unto God through Jesus Christ. You know? We keep trying to be un alive unto God. He didn't tell you to do. He said, be alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Through the one that, that you're one with. So, um, all right. So this is a little theme and I'm not going to, I think I'm not going to get into it, who knows real deep <clears throat> but I want to talk about the flood and I want to talk about the flood in relationship to um, in relationship to what really happened to the earth and, and so I, I'm going to break it down into two words destroyed or cleansed And I'm going to show this from two different angles um, so that we can comprehend that both have reality with it. Because when the flood came, it didn't destroy the earth. The earth was still there. It just dried up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Same old earth. Right? But it did cleanse the earth. But it didn't really cleanse the earth. Why do you say that, Randy? Well, because the clean and unclean animals were let loose. Because Ham was there just as much as Shem was. So there are, there are, uh, I, for me, I tend to know that in the scriptures, when it says something, it might refer one way yes and another way no, or something like that, to take the time to say, Holy Spirit, I mean, the way I did with this one was, I just looked at the Lord and I said, you didn't destroy the earth. You didn't do it. And then I looked and I saw everything look clean. I said, you cleansed it. Well, it's a shadow, folks. It's a picture for us of what Jesus did do and what we're learning about when it comes to the world of done. There are those things which we must see. And so, uh, like I said, I'm not sure how, how deeply I get into that right now. Let me, let me just read a little bit here <clears throat> of the earth it was said I will destroy them with the earth that's verse 13 God said that I will destroy them with the earth <clears throat> my emphasis here is the destruction of the earth in order to have a new creation okay. 
because that's where my mind went immediately when uh, even thinking of Noah and thinking about the flood and da 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 da. Well, this is this is new creation stuff, and and it is, it is. But um, again, once once we learn something in Sunday school or Bible class or church or something. We tend to tuck that in and say, okay, you know, this is, this is true. And anytime I hear the word new or something like that, I'm going to apply this. It is really extremely, I, I'm going to just say something silly here. It's extremely cool to be able to wait on the Lord and let him further. It's like, it's like, um, uh, we read a word like uh, uh, new, you know, new heaven and a new earth, and then so we read it within a context of oh, well that could be, that could work with Noah. Oh, that's really cool. And it's like we start shaking the Lord, and going, yeah, this is really cool and everything, and then we rush off to the next part instead of going, is there more in there? <laughs> Watch out when you say that to him. <laughs> is there more in there? There is more. There is more. There is more. There's mo so much more. So that we have to say, okay, well, here's this. I give you this. Now, if you want to share more, then, then I'm open and I want to hear from you. But you can't just apply what you heard over here about a new heaven and earth and say well it looks like this is totally that with Noah and his ark and then move on because you're going to miss eternal reality and we're just taking puzzle pieces and going mm -mm. oh look that fit together those two work you know <laughs> or get super glue and just start gluing them <clears throat> But first we must understand that in Noah's case, God didn't destroy the earth literally. He cleansed it with water. It still remained, but it is cleansed uh, in its cleansed form was still only a shadow form. It was, what, what is my word? Oh, it's similar to the new one wherein dwelleth righteousness. The new creation wherein dwelleth righteousness. You familiar with that scripture? <clears throat> this subject will be thoroughly dealt with later, but before the new can come, there has to be a vehicle of transportation into it. So, in the practical realm, what is that vehicle of transportation into it? The ark. Yay, we're going get to get in the ark. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, I want to talk about dimensions. God talked to, to Noah about it. This is uh, Genesis 6, 14 through 16. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. All right, so a couple of important things in here. Um, make it, you know, make the, the vehicle have rooms. I mean, if you're going to have a, an elephant, you got to have a big room. Or if you're a giraffe, you got to have a tall room. There are implications to this. Um, some of you know this from some of my other teaching on Noah, but the word pitch here is the word atonement, literally in Hebrew. Literally the same word. And and pitch basically is like if you're bringing two boards together and this is old school you're going to bring two boards or two you know 
tree trunks or something together, you put uh, black, what, you, what do you call it? Tar, and you put it there and then it dries and it gets strong and it also doesn't leak. Pardon? Fills the cracks. Fills the cracks, yeah. Which is important when you're gonna go in the water. <laughs> All right, that's what the atonement does. It fills the cracks and it keeps it all fitly joined together. All right, so let's see, I think there's a couple other things here. Um, um, well, let me just re read my notes. So this process involves make an ark, prepare it in advance, <laughs> Don't wait till it starts raining. <clears throat> uh, uh, the specifics of the, of the vessel of the ark, the dimensions of the ark. But in the context of representing the son of the father's love, let's look at the dimensions in that context, the son of the father's love. What, uh, let's look at the dimensions. What is the son to the father's plan? He is the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. This is Ephesians 3, 16 through 21, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with all might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in the key word, which is may, be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. This is the vehicle. Amen. <laughs> this is the dimensions. <clears throat> um, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Exceedingly and abundantly sounds like what? The world have done. The world have done. done. You should not forget that. No, no, you really shouldn't because that's a real key that while you're walking along, reading along, da da da, da you hit abundance and almost every time it points there. All right? So, abundantly above all, we ask or think, thank God, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And again, how's it end? Amen. Of course it does. <laughs> of course it does. All right, this measurement in verse 19 as given in these verses is beyond time. Let me read, read what it's talking about. It's beyond time, beyond this world, and is based on the fullness of God, who himself is beyond all these earthly constraints. That he might, that, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. All right, so let's talk about prepared in advance. Having prior to this looked at the sun being the full measure of God, it would now be advantageous to ponder the length in relationship to the preparation time for the sun as the ark. God had the plan long before it was needed. Okay, all right. So, world of done. God had the plan, had it all already there. He didn't go, hey, Holy Spirit, get over here and let's get, get this thing quick, it's raining. They already knew, they have the blueprint. The blueprint is the pristine sun. And so, um, it took Noah years to implement the plan, yet it had been in God's heart from before the foundation of the world. What does that sound like? 
world of, the, of done. It was done before, th this, this blueprint was done before the creation, the fall, death of Abel, ark before it was built, before the flood. Pertaining to that plan, God handed Noah the blueprint. Amen. Then, let's talk about a prepared place. Because it was. It was a prepared place that you must be brought into. The dimensions are based on God's reality, knowing what will be needed. The sun is prepared long in advance. He will contain so this is John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled, dang it. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not in there. <clears throat> you believe in God, believe also in me. In the Father's house are what? Many. Yeah, many rooms. Many rooms, make many rooms. Make it for the long and the short and the da 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 da, and I have prepared it. It's already been prepared. <laughs> um, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes. In Genesis, I have a note that also means nest. Means what? Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. Well, there it is. I mean, of course, you can't nest a, an elephant or, but anyway, that's it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so if it, you know, in my father's house, there's plenty of room. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. There's room. You were chosen before the foundation of the world. All right, so. Um, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, not unto a room, because it's in him the preparation is, because you are being placed in him, not just you know, a mansion that I know you were looking forward to. But it's not going to be a mansion. It's going to be better than a mansion, higher, more beautiful, more incredible. It's called Jesus. So, um, and I will receive you unto myself. And then it goes, and where I am, there you may be also. I love that. Where you, it's like Jesus saying, well, you know, where I am, you're going to be there. I, I prepared this and it's all, you know, let not your heart be troubled. I'm going, dang, I'm going to follow this guy. I'm going with him. <laughs> all right, so. Um. In these verses, Jesus knows how it will all end, talking about going and preparing a place and all this. He goes to prepare a place in advance for us, just as Noah did with the animals. In doing so, he wants us to know that it's, go it's all going to be all right. Okay, well, there's two ways of looking at that. We look at it's all going to be all right. Well, that means everything has to be really good and come, real, come full circle and everything. No, it's all going to be perfectly fitted and joined together in oneness with him. Yeah. And it's already really true. It's already, it's already what? Woo, we're getting... We're going to have fun after a while, aren't we? Therefore, he tells us to let not your heart be troubled. In verse 2, he makes this wonderful statement. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go. I go to make sure there's place for you. Make sure there's place for you. 
So I wrote this. I find this to be reminiscent of what Noah did for the animals. Remember what was said in Genesis 6.14, make the uh, uh, ark of gopher wood, rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it atonement within and without. Um, there were many compartments. Well, I already said all this stuff. Um, and since in reality in him is the true refuge, then he doesn't just receive us, but receives us to himself. This is not necessarily him going to heaven and building something, as much as him receiving us into oneness. And that is extremely secure. I don't know that you all really understand that yet, but oneness is extremely secure. It is extremely secure. It's based on the one. And as long as you agree with him that you're not the one, <laughs> then everything will be good. Um, well, we are almost, um, and this is, this is a perfect place to stop. My next sentence starts with, let's take a second to look at I promise you that it, it will run parallel with Romans too. Once we jump back over there, it'll, it'll even help you understand it a little more. And like I said, there's some of us who are more, you know, visual. I am, I'm one of those. And so reading these stories and then the Holy Spirit going ding, 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 and then looking over at the scripture, I go, woohoo, you might be, you know, um, what smart <laughs> uh, and so you read read the script, scripture verses here and there and then you can look over here and go oh I see that anyway let's pray father thank you so much for your wonderful heart for your son we agree there's none like him there is none like your son. The son that most of us know as Christians is the son of man, but we're talking about your son before time, the pure son, the pristine son with whom you had relations from who knows how long before creation. And oh, thank you for, for bringing it about that we could not just know him, but be found in him. Oh, Father, we need to be found. We need to be found, not just because we're lost, but because we haven't been found in him yet. So that when you look, you see not us, you see us in him. You see something that is unbreakable. Satan can never break oneness. He never broke it between you and your son and the Holy Spirit. He cannot break it. So we love you. And we ask you to keep opening your heart, not just scriptures, not just making us know more of the Bible. No, no, no. But you open in your heart to, to speak of your son and to show us rivers and valleys that are him that we could learn and walk in and walk with him. So thank you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.